because I think it's fair to say that CCUS without pipeline infrastructure and the ability to do that, uh, it's not going to be broadly commercially deployed. And we're going to need that. Um, so that's really the run of show today. And again, as we get through the first presentation, I'll, I'll do an overview of the white paper. We'll then take a break and then come back with those two panels, one after the other, and then we'll go to lunch at that time. Uh, as I said at the end of each of these presentations and panel sessions that you'll see, we'll have a couple of roving microphones uh, for any of you that have any questions you'd, you'd like to pose. I'm pretty excited about today. It's good to see the turnout that we've got. It's certainly a topic everyone's interested in these days, and we hope to do it justice in today's discussions. So with that, I'm going to roll right into the white paper and, uh, and give you a sense of where we're at. This is a piece of work that was commissioned very early last spring. Uh, in concert, again, with the Houston Energy Transition Initiative, HETI, uh, the CCUS Working Group within HETI, and certainly with the support of the CCS Alliance members. Um, every one of these companies, I think, has a war in the water in terms of making it happen. Broad commercial deployment, not an easy task. This is not institutional research anymore. We're not doing discrete projects. What we're trying to do is build an industry. And these companies are a part of that, I would say, part of that solution and, and having the capability and competency to drive it forward. They've made strategic commitments to CCUS as we have in, in our general community here in Houston. It's gonna be an essential part of decarbonization and an effective way to do decarbonization. The commissioning of this work was largely driven by the fact that we had an NPC study in 2019. Many of you are familiar with it. I'm sure you all are. Talked about the, the implications of CCUS as broad commercial deployment across the United States. What's it going to take? And it was a great piece of work, 300 participating members. And, and the outcome of that was is really a, a, a stepping stone for a lot of work that's followed but uh, I have to give a lot of credit to the NPC for working on that uh, and, and bringing it forth to the Department of Energy and the Secretary of Energy. What came from that study was a recognition that CCUS wasn't going to be the same for everybody everywhere, not even close, related to a lot of issues uh, around the proximity of the emissions, around the ability to transport the CO2, around the proximity of the emissions and the ability to concentrate and focus on emissions gathering, if you will, effectively so that it, the, the issue can be addressed. It's different across the country in a big way. But what the NPC study did say is that if we're going to do broad commercial deployment anywhere in the country, the Gulf Coast has to be a first mover target. We've got the proximal geology to those emissions. We've got a marketplace with capability and competency with companies that are interested in investing. And we've got a footprint here that says, we know how to do business. We know how to do this in the marketplace. Uh, it's highly technical, but it also requires the commercial dexterity that a lot of the companies that are involved in this have and are committed to. And with that, we actually published a paper a couple of years after that, 2021, called CCUS, a linchpin for the energy transition. And we believe strongly in that statement and will continue to do so. It's not a way to perpetuate the fossil fuel industry. It's a way to effectively and aggressively advance the energy transition. Because without CCUS, you're not going to be able to generate the hydrogen that people talk about all the time for the hydrogen economy in the kind of scale with commercial um, 
costs without the ability to decarbonize that hydrogen. There's nothing I hate more than the colors of hydrogen, so I, it pains me to say blue hydrogen, okay? But that's what we're talking about. And the truth of the matter is, it's decarbonized hydrogen at scale using CCUS. But there's other aspects of the energy transition. We're gonna need a lot more electricity. We're gonna electrify the world, if you will, through the energy transition, and that's gonna require a lot more than simply adding additional capacity, whether that's renewables through wind or solar or, or other means that aren't decarbonized. And so if we're gonna to continue to effectively meet the energy requirements, electricity in the marketplace, uh, we're gonna need CCUS for natural gas combined cycle facilities. Uh, I, I guess if it's not too far away from your imagination, we still have a lot of coal plants in the state of Texas that also could make use of CCUS. Not everywhere, not every one. But there are opportunities for us to selectively and strategically look at fossil fuel facilities because it's baseload power that's decarbonized. It's a value proposition, frankly, that doesn't exist in the marketplace unless you're talking about nuclear power. And of course, everybody wants to shut down nuclear power. I'm not sure people don't want to shut everything down these days, but in, the t in terms of what we're talking about here, the ability to meet those needs going forward is, is, is incredibly dependent on the ability for CCUS to be, to be there. And that says nothing about the decarbonization of the hydrocarbon industry writ large. Petrochemicals, refining, all of the facilities that we have up and down the Gulf Coast that are raising enormous volumes of steam through heaters that are fed by natural gas that are all emitting CO2. It's probably well known to all of you, but less than 40% of all the energy we produce is electricity. So this idea that we're gonna get the net zero by putting in a lot more renewable electricity generation is borderline nonsense. What we have to do is aggressively go after all of the CO2 emissions wherever they are in whatever process they're involved in and whether that's making petrochemicals or whether it's processing refinery uh, fuels, et cetera, CCUS is gonna be critical to decarbonization across the board. So when we published that paper in 2021, we took a look at what the opportunities were, the size of the prize, the scale of it, and if you haven't seen the paper, please go to our website and take a look at it. But this is in some ways a knock-on to that paper because it also requires a significant amount of infrastructure to support a CCUS industry that's gonna be broadly commercially deployed in our region. And so when you take a look at it, and again, this is part of the thought leadership that came to us from Hetty and from that CCUS working group, and the, and the call for action for us here at the university to look into the pipeline issues, the electricity issues, the geologic issues, and the water issues. Those are the four key areas, and that's what you see up here on the chart, gives you a sense of those are the things that are going to be impacted, more or less depending on the pace at which we move, the investment that's going to be required or considered, and we're trying to inform that conversation. But while you look through those four lenses, you have to also be conscious of two other things, and we'll get into this in a second too. If you don't have a workforce that can actually make it happen, not just do the construction, but do the operations, do everything else that's associated with such a big industry impact. By the way, at the same time, the Gulf Coast is gonna do LNG, we're gonna do pet chem expansions, we're gonna do a lot of other things, but CCUS specifically will require a tremendous amount of workforce impact. Are people skilled, are they ready to go? Are we gonna to have to import labor from all over the country to do the construction? 
Is that even feasible? Is it sustainable? You might remember the oil sand story 15 years ago when everybody thought Canada was going to be the next Saudi Arabia of the world. And then I read a news release and it, it all came clear to me that it wasn't because they were flying in welders from Taiwan, putting them in helicopters from Calgary up to Fort McMurray, and those were the guys that were doing the welding. And I said to myself, nah, this isn't going to last. First of all, it became really expensive, and second of all, the quality of work wasn't all so good either. And so at the end of the day, those kinds of things need to be considered in a big way. So the workforce is a big deal. And we're going to need to be very, very conscious of that. And in that same light, what about the supply chain? Are we ready for this kind of additional investment? What are the costs going to look like? What's the availability of equipment? Since the NPC study, and even more recently, as people have put markers out there in terms of the cost on these projects, cost creep has become a real issue. Some of our panelists may actually be able to address that lightly in, in their discussions. But it's not just cost, it's also lead times. It's the ability to put things in the ground and actually have them functioning. And so if you don't get that in terms of these kinds of projects, you're really not looking at the whole picture. This isn't just some sort of an academic exercise, wouldn't it be great if... But what we tried to do is take a real honest look at how this is going forward. And frankly, some of this honesty may not be all that digestible for some who might have really high aspirations. It may not be digestible for those that really are maybe a little more reserved in terms of how rapidly we ought to be going forward. My own personal opinion I don't think this is going to be driven by events like COP28. This is going to be driven by industries and companies that are here in our community that have made pledges to their investors and their shareholders and their scope one, two, three emissions reductions. And one thing I learned selling gas for 32 years to companies like that was when my customer was telling me something, you better listen. And I think we're in a situation here where we have customers, a marketplace that's, that's moving forward in CCUS, not because they're, they're being shamed into it by politicians somewhere else in the world. They're doing it because they've made a strategic commitment. They got balance sheets. They've got capability and people. We have a really unique ecosystem here in our region. Shame on us if we don't take advantage of it. Those industries are going to lead this conversation. We're all going to be a part of that, including the university. And, uh, and that's what's exciting about all of this. I promise I'll go faster on the next slides. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I wanted to set the level set here for everybody as we walk into this today. Let me give some uh, thanks to the student researchers that worked with me uh, over the past summer. We spent three months working on this in these, in these areas. Um, you can see also that the thought leadership provided from not only at the top, from Shell and Mohammed. I don't know if he's here in the audience or not, but if he is, he was one of our key leaders, along with Sophia Cunningham from Hetty. Um, and the companies, I made a special request of Hetty that we have sponsorship and leadership, thought leadership from these companies. ExxonMobil, Calpine, Philips, Chevron, Dow. Not that these companies are responsible for the work product that we've produced. They are, we are most grateful for the inputs that they provided. They're not in a position to have to defend this work this is a University of Houston work product, but I want to make it crystal clear we couldn't have done this without them in terms of addressing the areas of focus that needed to be addressed. And so for that, I believe it made the work product something that could be very useful. 
I want to also call out the other two gentlemen that are in the pipeline group, Xi'an and Gautam. They're, they've actually volunteered to continue on working with me in the Center for Carbon Management and Energy. And I had a friend of mine ask me, did they really want to do that or, or, or what? You know, do they know you? <laughs> And, and the truth of the matter is I couldn't, couldn't be more blessed with a couple of fellows that are going to put their shoulder into it and continue working on in the Center for Carbon Management. So what is this project? What's the scope? We took a look at the greater Houston region from Beaumont to Freeport, it's eight counties. By the way, two, two of them not in ERCOT, Six of them are. And we looked at the four work streams that I just mentioned earlier, and we looked at it in three phases. Time horizons that build on each other, and we placed scenarios onto each of those time horizons. A reference case, which is a rather modest 10 to 20% of the capture. An accelerated case, which is 40 to 50% and a net zero case, which is sort of the popular term. And again, I want to emphasize this is industrial emissions, looking at emitters that are over a million tons a year. Not every cat and dog in the, in the region, but, but it's quite a number of facilities as we go down the list. And you see the details of that actually in the paper. And I mentioned workforce and supply chain. So that's really the overall scope of what we're talking about. And some foundational facts to work with. Uh, the total emissions from industrial source emitters today that are over a million tons are about 100 million tons per annum here in the region. And that number's on its way up in a big way over the next 25, 30 years. And so, again, as we look in the paper and we see where that's going, and that, that fundamentally, by the time we get to 2050, it'll be well over 200 million. And if you look at the NPC study, that's about half, not quite half, of what the entirety of the United States represented in the NPC study. So we got a big, we got a big ore in the water. The existing facilities meet the treatment and supply needs for water today. As we look forward into the future, you'll see what the impacts are. Uh, our region has been historically a net importer of power. We don't make as much as we consume. That's a tenuous situation sometimes. Thankfully, we've got supply that's being, and capacity that's being added, but it requires transmission to get here, and transmission projects aren't all that easy. And so that's something that we need to be very mindful of. Our current CO2 pipeline infrastructure, really the Denver Green Line, is about 20 to 30 percent utilized today, but that utilization and capacity factor will get exceeded very quickly as we start to look at the projects we're talking about here. So we're going to need more than just one pipeline for sure. And we have announced projects, five of them onshore and one offshore, that have been targeted for startup in and around the 2030. But I want to caution everybody that none of them are actually in final investments and, and working forward in terms of digging dirt and making things happen. And there are things that are going to be necessary to realize these injection projects for geologic storage. So let's take a look at the current state. Got industrial source emitters and CO2 pipelines and what we did was spot those locations where those emissions are occurring, again, over a million tons in a year, and where that pipeline goes. And you can see that a lot of the clusters of activity aren't necessarily right along that pipeline. But it certainly affords us a, a snapshot of where we are today. So then you start looking at saline formations. And the NPC study told us all that we have geologic capacity beyond imagination compared to anything else in the country. Pretty exciting. But then take a look at the footprint of the active oil and gas wells that are in that same geologic span. And what it tells you is 
you're not going to be able to put a well just anywhere. And the ability to aggregate those emissions into major significant storage areas is not going to be a short putt. It's going to require a lot of investigative work, et cetera. And you can see where those projects have been announced. And of course, they're finding places to go. But it's, it's going to be a challenge. And, and that says nothing about the offshore, because we have a lot of offshore capacity as well. But we really haven't done anywhere near the investigative work that has gone on through the last 20 years onshore in the United States through the Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnerships. So we've got development work, characterization work that needs to be done so we know what we're talking about, not just looking at a cartoon map like this and deciding where we're going to go. So those are your clusters. You start to look at where those a million tons a year locations are and you put them together and you start to get sort of intellectually wrapped around where those clusters are and how this is going to be, uh, you know, be, be thought through. Because this is where the capture projects are going to be and the CO2 will need to get aggregated. But then once you know that, then you know you have to go from clusters to hubs. You have to turn the Gulf Coast into a hub which is a collection of those uh, clusters. You have to be able to identify the geologic storage, not just one project at a time, but thinking about it strategically to be able to have significant storage capacity. And then we've got to think about the electricity supply and transmission to those clusters, because that's where the power is going to need to be. And that's where the water supply and treatment will need to be. But there's a takeaway message, pretty obvious. We're the energy capital of the world. We're proud to say it all the time, <laughs> right? But right now, aside from the demonstration project at Petronova, we're not capturing anything. And so that's going to be a challenge as we go forward to go from what, we're, what we understand and what we know we can do to realizing it. And that's the point of this, this presentation is we've got work in front of us and we'll need to get after it. So let's go back to those cases. First case is a reference case. I have to thank my good friend Scott Nyquist who's in the audience here because I originally called this the business as usual case. And he reminded me it's not business as usual, Chuck. We're not doing anything yet, okay? So we've, we've, we, we renamed it the reference case, which is really kind of a modest approach of taking the amount of projects that we've, we've announced between now and 2030, and we do the same amount of projects in the next decade and the same amount of projects in the decade after that. This is a rather modest approach, not insurmountable, certainly, but it's, it's not quite easily done, if you will but in and of itself represents 10 to 20% of the emissions. The accelerated case is 40 to 50%. And by the way, that happens to match up with the Houston CCS Alliance target that was originally introduced to the marketplace. And so if you look at 50% of the volumes that we talk about here, we're looking at about 100 million tons per annum. And if you go back to where that actually that's the, how the math works out. That's where the projects and that's where the scope of the original CCS Alliance was going to identify. That's a lot of work, and you'll see how much in just a second. And then, of course, there's the ever-popular net zero case, which basically throws the covers off of everything and says, I'm going to get all the emissions I can possibly get and get the net zero. I'm not here to judge, and I don't want my tone of voice to color anything. Although that might be difficult, all right? But, but what I will say is there's a real challenge out there and a real opportunity. So this is, your this is your reference case. This starts out by those five projects, and you can see step by step into the next decade and the following decade. And then if you compare that to the net zero bar, kind of stunning, isn't it? And so we're going to leverage the existing green lines and we're going to have to start offshore infrastructure 
evaluations if we're ever going to think about 2040. And you might ask, well, why would we have to worry about offshore? And the answer is, do we know for sure everything onshore is going to work? Do we know for sure that all the environmental issues associated with onshore storage here in the Gulf Coast is going to be sufficient to allow us to even take a modest approach going forward? I would suggest if you don't plan for optionality, you're not thinking. In terms of electricity, we need additional electricity into our region and transmission projects that have been announced are still not in construction, but they have been announced. We're probably going to need more. And we're going to need to look at the existing natural gas facilities that we have today that often run at about 60% utilization factor, if you think about it. Because of the vagaries of our market and the way power is not just produced, but actually priced, and we have an opportunity to increase that utilization capacity for the electricity generation on our natural gas supply facilities, but we have to have a market construct that rewards that, certainly. And basically, water is okay. This is probably the one of the four that we're doing okay, and we'll probably be in a good shape if we take this reference case approach for the next 25 years. But then if we don't, and we go to an accelerated case, this is what it looks like. Now all of a sudden you're going to need those pipes to start forming pretty quickly at those clusters beginning to connect the networks. The storage and the announced sites are going to have to be, in terms of capacity, multiplied pretty quickly to be able to meet these demands. I mentioned the electricity and, and the uh, capacity factors at the natural gas producing, uh, electricity producing plants, but we're going to have to start thinking about cogen. Why? Well, not only for the electricity, but also for the steam that's going to be required to do all these capture projects. That's a lot of projects. In a fairly short period of time, if you think about it, it's 27 years from today to 2050. A lot of projects. And ultimately, the water impact starts to show up, and the planning and the thought process around potentially desalinization is going to be critical. And again, let's remind ourselves, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's going to be going on in the Gulf during this period of time. We're going to do LNG, we're going to do expansions in pet cam facilities, we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. All of it's going to impact infrastructure. This is discrete to CCUS only. So also something to be mindful of. And then there's this. Look like a hockey stick to you? So pretty, pretty ambitious. All right, multiple storage sites, pipelines that will have to connect those clusters in a big way, both on and offshore. Electricity requires more than just natural gas utilization, but the integration of renewable sources from West Texas and transmission lines, storage, some of it, well, no, let me say it, most of it, which doesn't exist today in terms of electricity storage and the ability to integrate those renewable facilities. We're going to have to do it because there's going to be a lot of capacity, but we're going to have to utilize it. And in terms of water, the requirements for desalinization will actually occur as early as 2040 in this case. So this kind of paints the picture, and that's just the picture through the lens of emissions reduction. You notice I didn't say anything about reliability improvements, and I sure didn't mention cost which is the thing everybody gets pretty wound up about. Can we, can, we, can we do this or should we do this with CCUS? And I would subscribe to all of you here. It's probably the question that's, I think, the least relevant. If you look at the IEA and the EIA and those studies, what does it tell you in terms of climate targets? It tells you that 15 to 20 percent of the world's emissions reductions will have to come from CCUS. It's not an option. It's a requirement. So stop the nonsense about how we should or shouldn't do CCUS. We got to do it. And we have to do it because we have to have that hydrogen. We need to decarbonize the electricity system. We need to decarbonize these hydrocarbon facilities. And yeah, it's going to cost. Of course it's going to cost. 
we're not baking in any amazing transformational technology changes here that's going to change the cost curve overnight, and that's the reason we ought to do it. I think that's nonsense also. Could happen. We hope it does, and we're going to continue doing research here at this university and working with all our industry partners to try to see that happening. We're going to learn by doing. We're going to do the first of a kind, and we're going to do the tenth of a kind. And as we do it, we're going to get better and better and better and more cost effective. But is it going to be easy? No, it's not going to be easy. To get the net zero, my goodness, what a mountain to climb, right? And again, you go back to the will of the people and how much, how much are we really committed to making this happen, right? And, and that's the whole thing. You've got you've to understand that this is, this is not going to be something that will be easy. It's going to require the will and the drive to make it happen. So what are the keys to success? In the pipeline, I think it's pretty clear. We need to go from clusters to hubs, and we need to do it pretty quickly. And a hub means we're effectively aggregating those individual discrete six areas that you saw, those bubbles, connecting them together with pipelines and being able to have them directly associated with geologic storage that's of a suitable amount. And that, what's that going to take? Well, the regulatory and right-of-way regime is less than clear in this state, in a state where probably we've got as many pipelines as any other state in the country, and we know how to do this. But more and more, every time we're looking at new pipelines, and you're going to hear about this in the second panel this afternoon, this is not an easy putt. Communities are engaged, communities are impacted, etc. The term environmental justice comes up all the time. It's real. And it's going to impact our ability to do more than just draw a line where it's the most advantageous to run the pipe. We're going to have to figure it out. And by the way, CO2 today is not done by common carrier pipelines. By the way, neither is hydrogen. And so by virtue of that, the whole concept of eminent domain becomes a very, very difficult topic for privately owned pipes. Storage. You saw the map. This is the takeaway message. Of all of that amazingly large geologic capacity that the NPC study identified in the Gulf, there's really only 10 to 20 percent of it that's available for storage, if you look at all the oil and gas footprint that goes over it. Now, the good news is it's an enormous amount of volume from a really enormous amount of volume that was identified. So we got enough. It's not a question of having enough. We have the capacity. We have the ability to do it. The trick is going to be being able to cite it and being most effective with it. We're not going to run out of geologic capacity, but the point is you can't just go punch a hole anywhere you want to in our region. And the other thought of it is, although we talk about offshore all the time, about how vast that storage is, we haven't done any of the work necessary to do the characterization and the understanding of the best practices offshore like we've done in the regional partnerships onshore in the United States for the last 30 years. We got a playbook today. And much of that is being done in the Midwest and other places around the country, even here in, in, the, in the Houston area and over into Louisiana and looking at class six wells and everything else. But there's a whole regime of offshore storage that you know, we believe is potentially available to us, but we've got to start digging in. I, my, my thought is right now, even though you may not need it in the next 10 years, it'll probably take you 10 years to get there. Electricity, I mentioned the renewable integration along with the natural gas plant utilization, transmission and storage. And the other thing I would recommend that we all remind ourselves is we're in an energy-only market here in Texas. And so when you start thinking about the market construct that we're working in to build baseload capacity and have it recognized for the baseload capacity that's delivering as well as being carbon-free, I would imagine a market 
ought to reward an investment like that so that facilities like that can get built and can be operational and functional. We're not there yet, but it's something I think all of our regulators and, and all of our, from, from industry standpoint, we need to recognize that as an essential part of going forward. And finally, I mentioned that the supply balance will probably evolve depending on how rapidly we go forward and desalinization will be a large consideration in the future. Now, there's a lot more detail in the white paper, and I don't have the time, and you don't have the, the moment here to go through all those gory details. Really uh, ask you to look into this, because we did the calculations associated with it. We got the help from the industry to look at these emissions rates and what it was going to do to impact each of these. But I remember we said there's two other things we've got to keep our mind on. And that's the supply chain and the workforce. So if we look at the reference case, I would call it that's sort of the low risk, low impact. We're, we're going to continue to have students and a good marketplace, and we'll be able to do those projects. But if you start working up toward the accelerated and the net zero cases, compressors, pumps, steel pipes, all of that, competing also with the LNG industry, blue hydrogen, ammonia projects, a lot of construction, a lot of things going on and a lot of things to operate. And we're going to need to identify suppliers and access delivery capacity at an early stage. Like I said today, I think it's three years for a major size compressor right now in the marketplace. That's pretty tough. It's a pretty tough delivery time window to work with. And we're going to need to develop alternative suppliers. And in terms of the workforce, we're going to need to develop those high-skill laborers, not just here at the university with new students, but reskilling those in the marketplace. Many of your companies have introduced new divisions in your organization called the Low Carbon Group. Bring people in from other departments. They're very skilled people. They have a lot of capability. But in terms of really knowing what's going on in CCUS, there's a learning curve in a big way. We actually hope to be a part of that help to all of us in the community here in terms of the programs we're offering on extended education, et cetera. But it's going to take more than just a university. It's going to require all the skills and the interaction with that and the engagement, again, between educational institution and employers. White papers published. It's going to be upstairs at lunch today. I think we only have 150 copies, so if you need to get in front of the person that you're behind. <laughs> you might want to figure out how to do that. Uh, but we'll have more later, no worries. We'll also be uh, putting it on our website, and it'll be available, as will this presentation be available on our website afterwards. Again, my two colleagues, Gautam and Gian, I want to recognize them again. They're here in the audience, and they've actually got microphones for any questions. There they are, right here, right here. And uh, Yeoman's work. And, and yes, they did volunteer to continue working with me, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, guys. Thank you. Um, so, that's the end of my prepared remarks. We're at 20 after, and we're going to take a break at 9.30. So, anybody have any reactions? There's a gentleman already up there. So, I'll, uh, I'll ask these fellas to find a way up to you. We want to get your question on the microphone, if we could. Uh, but why don't you go ahead, while they're finding the microphones, why don't you just say it, and I'll repeat it for the video here. The uh, question was, Equinor has been doing this for offshore storage activities for the last 20, 25 years. Uh, uh, we have been very fortunate to have a, a really nice relationship with not only the, the Equinor folks, previously Statoil, but also the University of Bergen and Stavanger and places such as that do a lot of cooperative work. We actually have a couple of our faculty that are from experiences in that area uh, in our petroleum engineering department and and we get reminded often about some of the work that's that's gone on there 
clearly important, clearly something to leverage and, and to be mindful of. And we're, we're taking all the steps we possibly can in our, in our departments to do that very thing that you just suggested. But also to remind ourselves, as the geologists often tell me, and I'm not a geologist, so I just take it for face value, it, it's different everywhere. And then the other thing they say that drives me crazy is you won't know until you drill. Well, you know, okay, well, so what does that mean, right? And, and it's, it's certainly more scientific than that. I don't mean to make light of it. As an engineer, it's maddening, though, because you want to do your cost estimate, right? But, yeah, you, you, you're absolutely right. And here's the one thing that I believe strongly is in the United States, although we put a tremendous amount of effort into onshore storage evaluation work that was originally driven by the DOE, and I was a part of that 10, 15 years ago, it's a pretty unique country here in the U.S. that we have this geology and these vast amounts of land to use. I happen to believe that offshore storage will likely be the global solution that we'll all need to pursue. It's not in anybody's backyard, and the capacities are enormous, and the ability for the rest of the world to capitalize on CCUS is, if, and I, I think I have this right, but over 75% of the world's population lives less than 100 miles from a coastline. Well, what's that tell you? It tells you a lot of the industries are near the coastline. It tells you a lot of the concentration of where people are in places like India, China, Indonesia. These are places that aren't going to be doing, I don't think, a lot of onshore storage. They're going to do it offshore. And so it's important to leverage that. Appreciate your question, because I think it's very, very germane to this topic, and it's something that ought to be in our minds here. Because if we do one thing here, of just solving the emissions issues in Houston will have failed. We need to develop an industry that we can then take the knowledge and the know-how globally to really solve the emissions issue. Because what are we, like 10% of the world's emissions or something here in the US? And frankly, Norway is, <laughs> I don't know, it's less than 1%, right? But the knowledge and the know-how that's being evolved is critical so that we can migrate this globally. But thanks for your question. Yes, ma'am. So uh, you mentioned that you do leverage the state of housing. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the projects are going to be a lot of preparation. So are you assuming that New York can already do the list of things and then go maybe to a larger location or a specific location? Uh, the, the question is, are we anticipating, first of all, that the leveraging of CO2 pipelines, which is largely devoted to the enhanced oil recovery industry in places like West Texas, Wyoming, et cetera, uh, and, and even to the east of us, into the Jackson Dome in Mississippi, uh, are we anticipating those lines will will be the main reason or the main driver for us to do storage through the enhanced oil recovery process? Let me give you a two-part answer. First of all, we have about 5,000 miles of CO2 pipeline today in America, most of it, to your point, dedicated directly to enhanced oil recovery. Most of those miles are located in remote areas nowhere near emissions. There may be emissions points, naturally occurring facilities, et cetera, where those pipelines are getting their CO2 from. But this is, this is a, a pivot point in our thinking around CO2 because now we need to look at anthropogenic CO2. We need to look at the facilities that are generating. And if you look at those clusters on that map, what we're gonna have to do is connect not only to the Denbury Green Line, but also run the new pipes that are going to go to storage because the answer for CO2 in a big way is not EOR, it's storage. Should we continue to do EOR and take advantage of anthropogenic storage, anthropogenic emissions to do EOR and then successfully, permanently store that CO2? 
I think there's nothing wrong with EOR. I think it's a wonderful way to do it, but it's not what the focus is gonna be over the next 30 to 40 years. We have vast amounts of CO2 that we have to capture from point source emissions locations, which will be driving the need for pure storage. And, and while everybody says, well, EOR is bad because it makes more oil, that's also nonsense because you only make as much oil as you need. And that oil is probably better than any oil that you'd make anywhere else in the world because it's actually storing CO2 while you do it and the carbon intensity of that oil is lower than anywhere else in the world. But stepping away from that, not to make, not to make a case for EOR, but a case to simply say there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it's a good thing but it's not going to be the thing. It's going to be pure storage, I believe. Yes, sir. Yeah, and I'll repeat your question, unless you want to repeat it again. Go ahead, please, for the microphone. And you're speaking specifically of the Center for Carbon Management and Energy? No, 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 no. This, this is the uh, the role of uh, also really going for decarbonization when you talk about carbon and CO2. Why do we care about it? De and you're talking about desalinization is your question. Okay, well, and what desalinization in this presentation specifically addresses is the additional need for fresh water, not simply to support the CCUS operations, but I think everybody here recognizes that we're going to have a tremendous amount of demand for fresh water for things like electrolysis units. Everyone wants to talk about green hydrogen. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's going, to be a, it's going to be a big thing. I'm not suggesting that green hydrogen is necessarily something we should ignore by no means. I also do recognize that blue hydrogen will likely be the lion's share of the volumes that are going to be addressing the decarbonization needs in our region. And those facilities are going to require the steam and the fresh water for that steam and that's where the desalinization is going to come into play because at some point you can't just assume that you're going to continue to tap into the fresh water sources that we have. We can do it for a while, but over the next 20 years, that's going to come to a head. Sorry, I, I didn't understand your, your question, but then, yes, sir. Look, I'm the first person, and, and just to repeat your question for everybody, the, the driver and the demand for utilization of CO2 in terms of products and, and, and the applications for it. Look, I'm the first person in the world that would celebrate utilizing CO2. I, I think it's the smart thing that we should do. It's the opportunity that we have to take advantage of. But I'm also very mindful of the scale that we're talking about here. We're talking about millions of tons a year. And so when people start telling me about how they're going to make a, a pile of graphene or they're going to do this or that, I mean, it's all good. But it's not the scale that's going to be impactful and relevant to the marketplace to meet climate targets, which is why storage becomes, I'll call it the first mover opportunity. I think that all the major industries are looking at these days. And they're not turning their back on utilization, by no means. And, and looking at more innovation and more transformative technologies, 
We're doing it here at the university every day, looking at how we can integrate renewable energy to convert the CO2 into meaningful chemical products, all of that stuff. This is a nascent industry. And we got a ways to go before we hit that scale. So the question is, what are we going to do now? We need to get busy with this and continue to have that concurrent path for transformative technology development. I believe that's the answer, OK? It's easy to say, but the actual evolution of it is what, what we're going to all see. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think if you look at the countries around the world and look at what we're doing here and the ability for us to make products like methanol and, and ammonia from the U.S. with CCUS as part of that, those products go over to Japan and are immediately identified as low carbon intensity ammonia. That's a selling feature. I don't know how much of a premium you get for that, but at the end of the day, it's part of the evolution of the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, for sure. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Joe. We appreciate uh, this, everything uh, everybody's doing, and uh, certainly best to be with it all. But here's a, a question. There's always a but, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> But that's okay. Keep going. As they say, pay the man, right? Thank you for the question. You're absolutely spot on. There's a couple of observations, though, I think that are important. I, I use this a lot because I think it matters. So we got 50 states in this country. 14 of those states produce 85% of the energy that's consumed in our entire country. You mentioned one of my favorite states, Massachusetts. They don't make anywhere near as much as they consume. They certainly have a lot of opinions about how energy should be made and the fact that they don't want to pay a nickel more for it once you do that. And that's consumerism, right? Well, we live in a great country, so people can, can do that, right? I think what's important is we need to recognize CCUS is not an industry for everybody everywhere, not even close. It needs to be utilized in places where you have those kinds of advantages. We're lucky here in the Gulf Coast that we've got what we've got. The panel that's going to be right after this, after our break, is going to talk about the Mount Simon Formation up in Illinois, which is an absolute whale of a place for CO2 to be stored. And it's a tremendous economic advantage that people in that part of the country can take advantage of. The first carbon capture project in America, you may know this, was done in the early part of the century at Wisconsin called We Power. It was a demonstration project. And they put the carbon capture facility onto the, the, the plant, captured the carbon, and guess what? They vented it. You know why? Because the geology in Wisconsin was absolutely impossible to inject CO2 into. So, if you don't have the geology, or if you don't have the access to the geology, there's no point in doing CCUS. We have places in the country where it's, I believe, tremendously advantaged. 
I could say the same thing about places around the world where there are major concentrations of industry. But I think if you try to please everybody in every location in America, you'll fail. The 36 states that aren't the makers are probably going to be very difficult to satisfy. And I don't know that any CCUS projects have been envisioned for New York or Massachusetts or Vermont, okay? Because they're not making any energy. We are, and we have an obligation, and we have an opportunity. And I think the opportunity is twofold. Not only our own emissions and our footprint and the products that we'll make, but the ability to take that know-how and knowledge globally, to make money on it, to, to provide the value that can occur in the places in the world that want the U.S. innovation and technology. I can tell you firsthand from living over there that people in Indonesia don't want John Kerry to come and tell them how they ought to behave. What they want is technology that can change their lives, that's accretive, and it's been developed in our country through the know-how and the knowledge of the companies that, that work here. That's what the world wants. And the innovation and the responsibility to develop that is, is really what it's all about, I believe. Well, it's past 9.30, so I think I may have overstayed my welcome, but we, we got time for one more question, perhaps. There we go. Okay, well, it's, a, it's sort of a two-part question on environmental justice and the workforce, but I'm delighted to be able to tell you that we've got two concurrent programs here at the university that we're working very actively with community colleges in disadvantaged places along the Gulf Coast where we're developing those skills because the real key for communities in terms of being disadvantaged, they're looking for jobs, they're looking for opportunity, and they're looking for the, the good actions of those that are making the investment in those communities. And the second part of that answer is we have been actively involved with something called a CCUS consortia, which has been sponsored by the Department of Energy and the University of Houston is actually the center point for that. We've got 68 organizations that are part of that consortia, all dedicated to the broad commercial deployment of CCU, excuse me, of CCUS, but it's not about technology, and it's not about engineering. It's about the above the ground issues that you just mentioned, in terms of the workforce and the community engagement, and having a better way to educate people in these communities in terms of what's actually happening and how it can be beneficial to the community. Not just for the world's CO2 issues, but for their community specifically and listening to them and doing the education. There's an organization that's been spurred up here of late that was involved a lot in the Midwest called the Smart Carbon Network. There are people here in the audience that you may want to bump into uh, during the breaks or at lunch. In terms of that educational platform, we're intending to be intentional about that very thing here at the university over the coming years because we see that as the probably the single biggest issue that may be in front of us in terms of broad commercialization. And it's absolutely, and, and it's not to be dismissed by no means. It's a reality and it has to be addressed. I'm gonna wrap this up and invite you to enjoy some coffee and camaraderie out there and we'll be back here at 10 o'clock sharp for a couple of panels that you won't wanna miss. Thank you.